and uh, uh, Adam wears many, many different hats at the uh, TM Center, and he's also on our medical advisory board, and he is also a tremendous supporter of our community and a, a good, a very good friend of Pauline's and mine. Um, when Adam is finished with his talk, we're going to have a discussion in here about onset experience that is going to go as long as, Adam's going to talk for as long as he wants. You're going to be able to ask him as many questions as he wants afterwards. If we have a half hour for our discussion, uh, then we'll talk for a half hour. And if we have 30 seconds for our discussion, we'll talk for 30 seconds. But I'm going to want for you to be able to ask your questions of Adam when he's done. So, Dr. Kaplan. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. And uh, I'm going to start by telling you my onset experience. Uh, it was uh, back in 2001 at this conference that I was sitting perched with a grant to go out and study the biological basis of schizophrenia that I came to this conference and had a chance to meet many of you who are still here and uh, people uh, who I haven't met here and um, ultimately have completely shift gears, left all of that stuff behind, and have uh, devoted myself hook, line, and sinker to studying these autoimmune diseases, particularly transverse myelitis. So the one thing I will tell you is that if you find yourself at this conference not wanting to devote your entire life to transverse myelitis, don't talk to Sandy and Doug in the context of this conference, because it's all over at that point. So um, what I also wanted to tell you, because this is obviously, uh, the, the tough part is always to sort of talk about depression without leaving everybody depressed. Uh, and uh, what, what I wanted to tell you is that it is my privilege to be able to talk to you in three parts. Um, not all right now, by the way. Uh, the first part is to tell you some of the research we've done at the Transverse Myelitis Center here, looking at the way in which these autoimmune diseases, uh, like uh, MS, but particularly transverse myelitis, actually has an effect on the brain that results in depression. And I'll define for you what depression is um, as we go along. But, but what I will tell you is that um, it, it has necessarily become the case that I'm just going to start the story today. And the second part of this story is to tell you how our investigations of depression, Doug, uh, uh, you know, all of this work I've done has been side by side with Doug Kerr and uh, uh, Chitra and the other parts of, uh, of the Transverse Myelitis Center, the other uh, people who are involved, and uh, the crew, the posse, I guess. And um, ultimately, it has led us to important insights into the key mechanisms that, that, that uh, cause transverse myelitis. So, so that will be the second part of the story, how studying depression has led us to understand this neurological illness uh, at a level that we didn't initially, and that talk will be tomorrow. And then the third part, just a preview, is that I'm going to, I've actually uh, graciously been given the opportunity by a patient whom I met uh, in 2001 at this conference. Oh, I'm too loud. <laughs> Towards me. Okay. Michelle's taking care of me so I don't hurt myself here. And um, ultimately, uh, this patient uh, uh, person came to me at the 2001 conference, uh, or, or came to me after the 2001 conference and said, you know, I saw your presentation. Um, and I think I might have what you were talking about. Uh, and um, he's allowed me uh, to share sort of what transpired over the course of two months uh, in treatment. So you can sort of get a sense that this isn't voodoo, that, uh, that the treatment of depression is very much like the treatment of any other aspect of transverse myelitis. So that's the three parts. And I'm going to start today uh, talking about demoralization and depression. And before I talk about that, what I want to obviously talk to you about is that not everybody gets demoralized and not everybody gets depressed in life but uh, with, with these illnesses. So uh, this, is, this is a study that was done in, multiple, uh, in patients with multiple sclerosis. And an average of nine years after the diagnosis, all of these patients had relapsing remitting MS. They lived in Northern California and they were interviewed over the phone. And then they went through and they ascertained, you know, they, they interviewed them, how, how are you doing? Basically, they're, they're, how they were functioning emotionally, socially, at work, uh, interpersonally, and the like. And the responses they got, they grouped into basically three main headings. And the take-home message about this is that 
20% of the responses they got basically suggested that the, that, the, that the multiple sclerosis had put a strain on their relationships with you know, their significant others, with the people in their lives. And that, I don't think, comes as a shock to anybody. 30% or one out of three said that they had become demoralized a, at some point and endorsed those kinds of things. But what sort of, I think the take home message is that two thirds of the, the comments and the people that they uh, polled in this phone interview said that actually MS is something that they had benefited from. And <clears throat> this is just sort of a tremendous study in that sense. These are the kinds of things that they said that they've realized that their friends and family are more helpful, they're closer to their family, uh, they've learned to be more compassionate as a person, more respectful of others, they appreciate their lives and uh, uh, their independence uh, more than they ever did. So I just, I, I mean, I just want to let you know that it isn't set in stone that just because you get a, a chronic illness that that means it's, it's, it's going to derail you from life. And in fact, in this case, and as in many cases, people have actually learned uh, important things and appreciated important things uh, about themselves and life, their life that they wouldn't have normally appreciated. And I will tell you, two of my close personal friends, Paula Laziri and um, Cody Unser, I think will talk to us over the next couple of days about some of these things that they've discovered. So this is the problem with when you get a massive uh, uh, insult like transverse myelitis or other rare neurological diseases. It says, there is no despair so absolute as that which comes with the first moments of our first great sorrow, when we have not yet known what it is to have suffered and be healed, to have despaired and have recovered hope. And that is really uh, sort of where the demoralization discussion starts, which is that for all of you who have been personally affected either through your bodies or your loved ones with this, it probably represents, not necessarily, I mean, I hope lightning has not struck you, you all twice, but uh, probably represents one of the first great sorrows that you've had to deal with. And again, I, I think that it's important to realize that it's easy to get demoralized when you haven't sort of seen the ability to sort of bear with it uh, and, and follow through and see what happens. So what is demoralization? It is a state of helplessness, hopelessness, confusion and subjective incompetence. The isolation is one of the, one of the terrible aspects of it that this conference really helps uh, with that aspect of it. And it results basically when people's coping strategies fail. And everybody has different coping strategies. And at some point, we can all become overwhelmed. Um, and uh, when, when that happens, that leads to a state of demoralization. The personal experience of being demoralized, I'm sort of describing it to you so you understand how this is different from depression. I know I don't really need to tell you what demoralization is. We've all experienced it in our lives. But basically, if you want to know how to sort of help people who are demoralized, you need to understand that they are experiencing the feelings that they've not only let the ones that they love down, but they've often let, them, let themselves down. And that feeling of you know, uh, ultimately being sort of impotent to to overcome these problems and, and, and uh, feeling overmastered in the moment, which is this terrible feeling of having a problem that you can't cope with, it's too big to get around it, and at the same time, you can't get away from it. So you're trapped. You're trapped in a situation that you can't get away from. And this feeling of isolation, which is that people, when they're demoralized, tend to not reach out at the times that they most need the help, unfortunately, and, uh, and they just figure that they're the only ones who have ever suffered like that. So the way, just to let you know, that, uh, that, that I go about trying to help people with demoralization, um, and this comes from Jerome Frank, uh, uh, who was sort of the leader in the field of demoralization, uh, is that you have to sort of break it down. So these big, enormous, monolithic problems need to be broken down into smaller problems. So a lot of times people come in and, to me and they complain, I am just exhausted all the time. Uh, I, I have, you know, they come in chronic fatigue syndrome and I just can't possibly get on with life. And what often ends up happening is that they find that if they can just work rest periods into their day, they're not just going all day feeling exhausted all day. Yeah, you got to take a break. And if, even if it means, you know, if you're still working, change your work schedule around. If you need to take an hour nap, you need to take an hour nap. And that often is what many people need to recharge their engines. And that experience of sort of finding a way, again, people often say, well, it's hard for me to maneuver the aisles when I'm shopping and there's lots of people around. So you go during non-peak hours. You find what what are the biggest problems? And then you begin to strategize with the person or yourself. How can I go about solving this problem? Each victory leads to a sense of confidence. And that helps combat the helplessness and, and sense of uh, 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 worthlessness and frustration people have 
the support and education, I know Sandy uh, will, will speak about this support groups uh, that exist in your area, and if not, you should start one, uh, because they are a tremendous uh, way to combat the hopelessness and isolation. Um, you're not the first one to experience whatever it is you're experiencing. Trust me, other people have been just in the same place. And then the cognitive reframing, which is a lot of times people come in and they say, oh, you know, I'm just, I'm demented. I can't possibly, you know, I, I, I think I've got Alzheimer's disease from this. Um, and what, what actually turns out is that they used to remember everybody's phone number, and now they have to write it down. And you just say, okay, now you gotta get a Palm Pilot. You're not demented, you just have to do what normal people do, which is you can't remember all the phone numbers in the world. But there, there are often ways in which you sort of help people to understand that this is not a dementia, this is you know, something that you can get around with a Palm Pilot or, or, or the like. And again, r just occasional reminders that it's okay to be me merely human. We all go through periods of time where we feel overwhelmed and the like. So the other thing I just wanted to make sure before I discuss the depression is that everybody here knows the issues about caregivers, okay? So I will tell you that when, when patients come to see me, when people come to see me, I spend sometimes an equal amount of time with the person who comes with them that I am with the person who has the di neurological diagnosis. Um, and, and certainly, initially, um, that's a critical thing to do. And the reason why it's critical is that uh, it's very poorly studied, but there's no question that the success or failure of my patient is going to depend on them being able to maintain the functioning of whoever it is brought them in. And um, that there are positive and negative aspects to being a caregiver. Uh, obviously, being able to take care of someone you love, maybe return the favor of them having taken care of you previously. Um, but it is also important to realize that sometimes caregivers believe it's a zero-sum game, that I couldn't possibly leave my husband, my wife, my child at home because they've got this terrible illness and I'm just so lucky I don't have it, I just can't leave them for a minute. Well, that's not actually true. In fact, leaving them for a minute and having a chance just to sort of take care of yourself is absolutely what you need to do for that person. Okay, if they're going to do well, it's only because you're going to be able to do well. And um, uh, so essentially, often the wellness of the caregiver is a neglected area. Caregivers have much higher rates of heart disease and hypertension and the like because they don't go see the doctors. It's part of that sort of cycle of, you know, I, I can't possibly take care, I, you know, all of the problems that my loved one has, I couldn't possibly leave them and the like. So also it is worth noting that, one, that some of the variables associated with worsening the caregiver burden is amongst other things the unstable course. You know, if you have relapsing remitting MS or recurrent transverse myelitis, that's tough, uh, obviously. Worsening disability, that's not a big surprise, but actually depression is a huge one. That if for no other reason you should think about getting your de depression treated is because that's probably the biggest effect on not only your quality of life, but the quality of life of the people who are helping. So this says, and let uh, pl God please bless Alan Greenspan accept the things he cannot change, give him the courage to change the things he can, and the wisdom to know the difference. So of course, how do you go about helping the caregiver uh, find this kind of wisdom? So who cares for the caregiver? As I said, I, I know that uh, there are some clinicians and care providers here. I really can't stress how important it is to check in with the caregiver, even if it's just, so how are you holding up? And when I ask that of people, often they burst into tears and, and you know, no one has asked them how they're holding up. So that's a crucial aspect. Um, and uh, and uh, remember that they're in it together. You must remember both the, the person whose body it is uh, who's been affected and the person whose loved one's body it is has been affected. You guys are in it together. Uh, you need to come up with po problem-focused coping skills. Uh, the, the example that comes to mind is uh, a, a physician uh, who got transverse myelitis who came to me whose wife was a nurse. Now the only people who make worse patients than nurses are doctors. So this is a c scenario in which the nurse wife wanted to do what for her husband? Wanted to care for him. and. He felt like it, he was depressed and felt such a burden that it, it, it just, he couldn't possibly let her do anything to help him because he just felt that worsened his burden. So you can see how this dynamic set up that she felt rejected every time she tried to offer something and he felt he could, you know, was burdening her and what they needed to do is just realize you have to let her help you with this and you, know, you have to understand that he may you know, need to hear from you that this is not something that burdens you and the like and that communication can make a huge difference. Information is crucial, you know, coming to these conferences, hearing about what's going on, support groups and the like, is really, really important. 
And uh, the, the th one thing I, I often tell people, and I can usually catch them up in this, when I have someone who comes in with a loved one, uh, the caregiver, the significant other comes in, I say, you know when you get on those airplanes and the flight attendant comes up and when they first explain to the people who probably shouldn't be left with like sharp objects how to do their seat belts, then after that they then say, um, so in the, in the event that the cabin pressure uh, you know, drops, someone opens the window, your oxygen mask will fall down and m mothers and parents traveling with small children, you should do what? Put it on yourself first. And you know, the caregivers who are in the most trouble always say, put it on your children first. And of course, the reason why you don't do that is the children are flailing about and freaking out, and you have maybe 10, 20 seconds before all the oxygen gets sucked out of the airplane. And if, you, if the mom or dad puts it on themselves and the kids pass out, then it's really easy to get the mask on. <laughs> if, it's, if it's just struggling, then everybody goes down together. So often what I do is I tell people, look, once I tell them this, uh, I say, are you getting enough oxygen? Are you really sure? Are you, are you taking deep breaths here? Okay, so now depression. Um, and uh, I'm happy to talk about that later, but I want to turn so you understand what we're talking about when we talk about depression. And I will tell you, there's nothing more poignant to me uh, th than th that I could tell you uh, other than someone came up to me actually not knowing I was a psychiatrist and just said, I'm not sure uh, who to tell this to, but I, I just want you to know that this is like being dead while I'm alive. And my first question was, is that, the effect of the conference? Is that the kind of job we're doing here? Because I mean, I thought you guys are sitting for long periods of time. Maybe this is a worse conference than I thought we're putting together. But actually, she was describing um, a state of depression, okay? This feeling of, uh, it, it just feels like I'd be better off dead than alive. But so MDD does not stand for man in a deep depression. It stands for major depressive disorder. William Styron, who's written Darkness Visible, hates the term depression because it gets used for other things like a downturn in the stock market or a dip in, divot in the road. And he says, look, this thing that almost killed me is not just like a divot in the road. So he hates that term. And that's not what we're talking about here. So what, what I have to begin doing is to ask you to forget everything you've ever known about depression unless you've had it and had it treated. And um, that's because everybody has sort of a common passing familiarity with what the term depression is. So it's like I went to the movies last night, it was really depressing. That doesn't mean you went to the movies last night and you had to then take an antidepressant afterwards. It just means you were sad. Um, and th there's a real difference between that and what we sort of call major depressive disorder. There's a part of the brain which is like the thermostat in the room. If it gets hot, it kicks the, the air conditioner on. If it gets cold, it turns it off. And that regulates the temperature. There is a part of the brain that regulates mood. And if it gets stuck, you have a fixed, unresponsive, low mood. Nothing, it's not a character weakness. It's not that you just aren't coping. Nothing will help you lift that, that mood. It's accompanied by physical symptoms, concentration, sleep, energy, appetite. And if untreated, these can often get very extreme. People who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and treated for their depression and go home from the nursing home, it can seem just like Alzheimer's disease uh, sometimes, particularly in the elderly, the concentration problems. I've seen people lose 50 pounds and, and get scanned all over their body uh, for uh, for an obvious cancer, which they didn't have, they just had depression. So these are just uh, big time kinds of things that people have physical symptoms. And there are brain alterations, and I'll show you uh, tomorrow, that we know that there are changes in the brains. The hippocampus, a region of the brain, actually gets smaller in people who are depressed. There are changes in sleep cycles. You can hook an EEG up to people who are depressed and see that there's differences in their brain waves. And if you don't believe me, just telling you that, um, drugs, the way they work is to exploit the fact that the brain regulates our mood. So if you don't believe that there's a thermostat in the brain, all you have to do is talk to anybody who's ever done cocaine, okay? And I've treated patients who have done cocaine, and when they do the cocaine, their spirits are great, okay? That's what uh, Pemberton uh, got rich and famous on, putting cocaine into this thing called Coca-Cola. And um, it is the real thing, uh, the way he did it. And um, when I say it's the real thing, you know, you know, uh, ain't nothing like the real thing. And when, when he did it, he did it by elevating people's moods initially, but then the next day, it, it causes this sort of transient state of depression, this utter, utter washout in the mood. And that, that is exploiting the same thermostat. And also, uh, just 
Everybody always wants to say, well, sure, you'd be, you know, Dr. Kaplan, you don't know. If you were in this wheelchair, if you were in my position, you'd be depressed too. I can't tell you the numbers of times I've been told that. And what I will tell you is, if you've ever read Tuesdays with More, you know this, but essentially ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, is a diagnosis from, uh, that within two years, you're dead. Everybody dies. You have no chance of survival once you get that diagnosis. And there is no higher rates of depression in ALS than there is in any diabetes or hypertension or any other chronic illness. And that's phenomenal. And the reason why that is, is because ALS affects those sort of cables, neurons, that go and innervate the muscle. It doesn't affect the brain. And that's the key here. If you get into the brain, that's when you get in trouble. So, you know, you can't convince me it's just the state of being demoral uh, or, or having some, you know, illness beset you. And in fact, there's no correlation between whether you're, you know, have some weak sensory symptoms uh, or are, you know, quadriplegic. There's no correlation with that and depression. So it's not sure you'd have depression too if. And the other thing I just, th this always strikes me is many of you, when you first came um, to a physician, were sent home with the idea it's just, you know, it's all right, you're stressed. It's because you've been fighting. Um, maybe you're just, uh, um, you know, n not really um, ready to handle the, the stress that's been going on at home and the like. And so you've been told uh, that you, you've been put in a position where you really have to convince the physician, no, this is something going on in my body. And that's part of what we need to do with transverse myelitis, educate physicians more and people in emergency rooms so that that doesn't happen. But what I have to do is I have to convince the same people who were sent home from the emergency room and told that this is all in your head, I have to convince them that, that the depression is not all in their head either. Because they say, look, you know, you'd be depressed too, you don't understand. And I say, look, I got to convince you, this is a biological phenomenon. So it's sort of ironic that I have to take the same people who have had that happen to them. So now depression. All, all people in the population, if you go door to door, it, one in 20 people are depressed at any given time. It's about 17% lifetime prevalence, twice as common in women as in men. We know that the peri, uh, menopausal period, the postpartum period after delivering a child, and the sort of uh, changes with the menstrual cycle all suggest hormones play an important role in increasing the susceptibility for women. And it is important. So this was a landmark study uh, published in JAMA, the, the premier medical journal in the United States. And it looked at the amount of disability people got in terms of their physical disability, social disability, number of days spent in bed, et cetera. And it compared the five big causes of chronic disability, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and lung disease to depression. Black means the medical illness caused worse disability in that area. White means that it was, they broke even. And gray means that the depression caused worse disability. And you can very easily see looking at this, that depression is second only to heart disease in the amount of disability it causes. And I wish that it was only disability, as terrible as disability is, the former Surgeon General Satcher said many failed to realize that far more Americans die from suicide than from homicide each year. For every two deaths you read about in the paper, some terrible thing that happened at the 7-Eleven in Detroit or what have you, uh, my apologies to whoever is from Detroit that just popped to mind, um, there, there are three deaths from suicide, at least three, that, that, that can be ascertained. So what, what, how, this is how I teach medical doctors to appreciate depression. So I'm going to take you just through a couple of slides here so you understand how I teach the, the physicians to understand it. Depression is a syndrome. It's not just a simple, a simple, it's not just a symptom, okay? Sadness, if you're not sad at some point in your life, you just haven't been paying attention to what's going on around you. Everybody gets sad at some point. That's sort of depression with a little d. Depression with a big d is uh, one of the, you know, one of this constellation of symptoms, only one of which is sadness. So sadness is to depression what cough is to pneumonia. People can cough uh, when they have pneumonia. However, not every cough is the result of pneumonia. If it's dry, if you're choking, if you've got asthma, many different reasons that people cough. Not all of them are pneumonia. Sometimes the pneumonia presents without a cough, and particularly in the young and the very old. Same thing with depression. Particularly in the young and the very old, it presents more as irritability, and they don't... And, report being sad. I'm not sad. Get the heck away from me. Um, and uh, consider the company it keeps. And if it's a productive cough with rapid uh, breathing and fever and a sort of a big fluffy sign on an x-ray, we call that uh, pneumonia. This is what we call depression. You have to have five of these nine symptoms for greater than two weeks, at least one of, us, at least one of which must be decreased interest or pleasure, not enjoying things as much as I used to, 
a low mood most of the days for the past month or the past two weeks, and then sleep is either increased or decreased, same with appetite, either eating more, comfort feeding, as many people call it, or loss of appetite. Food, by the way, doesn't taste the same when you're depressed. There are physiological changes in the body. People don't want to eat because it just doesn't taste the same. And um, there's also this sort of feeling of being worthless, fatigue and low energy, concentration problems. This psychomotor retardation, which just means, you know, we all know you can look at someone when they're really depressed and they're just walking through molasses, and then thoughts of death. If you have five of nine of those symptoms, at least, you've got the diagnosis of depression. The more symptoms you have, the more likely you are to respond to antidepressant medicines. And here's our report card. Well, actually, I think this is, my, is this my laser pointer? No. Oh, wait. So this is our report card uh, as a society in the United States for how we've done over the last 50 years. This is just published a few months ago from the Department of Health and Human Services. Over the last 50 years, we've decreased heart disease deaths by 60 percent because people have cut back on cholesterol. They know to go to the hospital if they have chest pain. We've decreased the deaths due to cancer by 40 percent. HIV, we've done very well with the new treatments that are available, but suicide is higher now than it was back in the 50s, okay? We're not only not doing good making inroads in depression, we're slipping. And um, so when I, you know, again, when I sort of approach the problem of depression, the question is, well, where do you begin if you want to try to treat it? And just like Willie Sutton said, why he robs banks, because that's where the money is, it was known previously that multiple sclerosis is where the depression is. MS has a 50% rate of depression. At some point during the course of their lives, people following their diagnosis, not before their diagnosis, following their diagnosis, following their symptoms, will get depressed. And so that raised the possibility of transverse myelitis because Doug Kerr came to me and said, I really think these patients are getting depressed. And I said, no, Doug, they're not. It's a spinal cord injury. Trust me, it's not depression um, because that's not the brain. But ultimately, I'll show you how Doug proved me wrong. But anything that affects the brain, you can see neurological disorders, autoimmune disorders, anything that affects the brain can cause depression. And MS is just the highest rate. So let me tell you about MS because we know the most about it so you can understand transverse myelitis. The lifetime prevalence of MS is already known to be 50%, which is three times higher than the general population. The current prevalence, which means if they, you look, you go door to door and you knock on doors of people who have MS, uh, one in four are depressed at any given time. Untreated, by the way, this is untreated data. And that's five times the rate of the general population. And who cares about depression? Well, it impedes rehabilitation. That's one of the chief reasons people get sent to me, that the doctors sort of, you know, they notice when the patient's not going to physical therapy, not going to rehab, not doing the kinds of gains, not taking the medicine. So that's a huge problem, is, you know, you can't take care of yourself when you're depressed. Quality of life is an enormous problem. Um, depression always ends up being the number one effect on quality of life in all of these studies on hypertension, cardiac disease, and the like, and function. Also, uh, you know, I have people come to me and say, you know, I have that uh, MS dementia, and I treat their depression, and, and that dementia goes away, or I have this chronic fatigue syndrome, or I have fatigue from TM, which many people get, and 80% of it goes away often. Sometimes 100, sometimes only 50%, but a lot of times the depression makes a significant effect. And again, suicide is enormous in MS. It's, uh, it's the third leading cause of death in MS after pneumonia and cancer. And the people who get cancer with MS are just like anybody else who gets cancer. They tend to be old and cancer is a major cause of death. People who get pneumonia are usually the people who are very debilitated, again, later on in life. But if you're young and uh, fairly, um, fairly unaffected by severe disability, the kind of disability that prevents you from being able to protect your breathing, then suicide's gonna be the number one cause of death. If you don't believe me, ask Montel Williams, his latest book, he details at least two of the very severe attempts he had at, at killing himself. So depression's common in MS. There's a significant morbidity and mortality associated with depression. And this depression is caused by the inflammatory insults to the brain. What's, why do I say that? Well, there's no correlation with physical disability. It's not just that you'd be depressed too if you had MS, because there's no correlation. The worst, actually one of the worst cases of depression that I've ever seen was DeVick's syndrome, which in 2001, a patient came up to me and said, after the talk, and said, thank you, Dr. Kaplan. Now I understand why I'm going to go home, but I'm going to go home and kill myself. I've sold all my belongings. I've stockpiled a lethal dose of medicine. And we sort of threw her in the back of my car and took her to the emergency room. Two weeks later, she's better. And uh, I can report to you that she's still alive and calls me periodically, and we saved her life. So uh, again, this was because she had very few symptoms. She came to this conference, and she said, yeah, I know I'm depressed, but there are some people here who are far worse off than I am. You can look at me, and you can't know that. 
what's going on, and I'm such a wretched human being that here I feel like killing myself. It only made her feel worse. There's no genetic loading, uh, meaning that people with MS don't have to have a family history of depression to get depressed. And this is the key. It's during times when they're having flares of their inflammation, that's when they get depressed, that's when they commit suicide. So then there's transverse myelitis. And again, as I said, Doug Kerr came to me, he's a friend of mine, I trained with him, uh, he was a year ahead of me in training, and I trained with him, I did my neurology rotation when he was a resident and I was an intern. And he said, after he was done, he said, look, I'm starting the this transverse myelitis center at Hopkins, I want you to come because I think everybody's depressed in the clinic. I said, Doug, look, it's really hard, I know, treating these patients, but not everybody's depressed, it's depressing you, or, you know, it can't be that everybody's depressed because people with spinal cord injury, not everybody's depressed. Christopher Reeves is, you know, not depressed. And it, y there is rates of demoralization that are high, but this is not where the mood regulator in the brain is, okay? It's not in the spinal cord. So I said, I don't think so, Doug. Now, the interesting thing is that Doug was right, but the way he was right was that this lesion that sits here in the spinal cord actually secretes something called a cytokine, and that cytokine goes up to the brain, and that's where it has its effect. And that was the key discovery we made to understanding what causes transverse myelitis, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. But then I said to Doug, look, let's, I'll prove it to you. They're not depressed. And we did a study of MS patients. Remember, highest rate of depression ever reported is in MS patients. Uh, they have the highest association of depression with it. And so we compared TM to depression. They had the same disability. There's no difference in their motor disability. And what you can see right here, this is uh, the dark purple here, is 16% of the patients with TM had severe depression, 35% had mild to moderate depression scores. Here it was statistically significantly it more than the MS patients. It was twice as much. Remember, MS was the record holder. Here it's come and take, you know, transverse myelitis has taken the record away from MS. And when we look, it didn't correlate with sexual disability. Here, this is increasing disability on this scale. This is increasing depression. Uh, didn't correlate with sexual di dysfunction. Didn't correlate with bladder dysfunction or bowel dysfunction. Didn't correlate with motor disability, whether you're in a wheelchair or not. There was a, a statistically significant but modest association with sensory symptoms. Now, are you by, by the way, are you guys surprised that of all of the things that it associated with, it was, it was pain? Is that surprising to you guys? I was a little surprised, but that's because I didn't really get it. And then patients taught me, look, you adjust to being in the wheelchair. You adjust to the fact that you have to use a cane. You don't adjust to the fact that you continue to have this pain going on. But I will tell you, the one thing that I definitely learned is that when you're depressed, the pain is literally 100 times worse. And uh, so I can't tell you if they're rating, if this association is because those people who are depressed have worse pain or depression causes the pain. But there's clearly, if there's, there's an association between sensory disability, but not with the other disabilities. And this was a finding that needs to be repeated. I don't want you to think too, uh, that, that there's proof here, but this showed that people who had steroids and they're coming, they're coming to follow up with us six to at least six months after the onset of their illness and uh, of their transverse myelitis. And if they had received steroids at the beginning, they were 70%, they had 70% worse scores on their depression scale. So what's the take home message for this? Well, it could be that the people who were depressed went to the emergency room and looked so pathetic, they looked so awful and they were suffering that they got the steroids. I don't think that was it because their disability, at least their recall of their disability, um, was that it was the same. Now, that, I can't prove that, but what I will tell you is when patients at Hopkins get sent for steroids and they have a history of depression and they're Doug Kerr's patients, he calls me up uh, and, you know, if they're people that have had a history of depression and I've been involved in their case, he calls me up and he says, can I put Mrs. Smith on steroids? And I say, yes, she's been stable. If her mood goes down, she'll call me. If the steroids, uh, you know, if, if the legs don't start working, she'll call you, okay? And you just have to be aware that steroids do have an effect on mood. I don't know that it's this big an effect um, all the time, but this is just what our data showed. But this is also what our data showed, and this is the scariest slide I'm going to show you the whole time I'm here. This is the rate of suicide in patients who have major depression. This is the rate of suicide in patients, this is per 100,000 per year, 168 per 100,000 per year patients with MS commit suicide. And this is the rate of suicide in patients who had transverse myelitis. So it does have consequences. 60% of all the deaths we've had in the 500 patients that have come through the transverse myelitis center have been because of suicide. And that is a completely preventable cause of death. That should never happen. So, um, so the conclusions, well, there's markedly high rates of depression in TM. They don't correlate with, you know, motor, um, 
bowel or bladder disability, what the spinal level was. We tested a lot of markers. The only thing it correlated with was steroid use, and, you know, six months or longer beforehand. There was a correlation with prick, uh, endorsing that you had prickling or tingling sensory disability, but that accounted for 10% of the depression. 90% is accounted for something else, and that's the immune system activation. Steroids I talked about, and there is a high rate of suicide. So this is the good news. I'm not going to end on a bad note. Of course your daddy loves you. He's on Zoloft. He loves everybody, okay? <laughs> so look, the, the most important thing I can tell you is that the good news is that it turns out, and it didn't need to turn out this way, that the depression in transverse myelitis is caused by the immune system affecting the brain, and I'll show you how that works tomorrow, but it doesn't matter. It still responds to the same treatments that we use for people who don't have transverse myelitis and are unfortunate enough to get depressed. So there are 23 FDA-approved treatments for depression. They can be used in combination. So right off the bat, I, without being very good at statistics, I'll tell you that's at least 400 different treatments that we have, at least. So when people come to me and they say, ah, that didn't work for me. I was on Wellbutrin. I did nothing. I say, what about the 399 other treatments we have that might uh, have made a huge difference for you? So it is very, very treatable. And there is no reason that, that people shouldn't be aware of that. It's also important, and when Doug sends patients to me, he says, look, I want you to see Dr. Kaplan not just because you're depressed and depression's a bad thing in and of itself, but I want you to see Dr. Kaplan because the data we have, and I'm happy to discuss this with anybody who wants to know, but the data we have as a profession and in the literature as well as at Hopkins says that if you're depressed, your MS is worse. And if you're depressed, your transverse myelitis is worse. So he sends patients to me as sort of his prescription for how to make sure that the transverse myelitis is going to be the best that it can be. And when you actually study the immune systems of people who are depressed with these disorders like MS and transverse myelitis, their immune systems are much more activated, much more aggressive when they're depressed. You treat the depression, actually with talk therapy or medications, you treat the depression, and if the depression goes down, the aggressiveness of their immune systems go down. We also know that MS and not only does MS and TM cause depression, and I'll show you how that works tomorrow, you'll tell me whether I've convinced you or not, but depression and stress worsens these days. And in fact, that's a huge contribution. The, the ability of depression and stress to worsen MS is bigger than the ability of Copaxone to make it better. Not that Copaxone's a terrible drug, but these things have a big impact. And we could have a discussion about how come that is, but that's the reality, the impact is enormous. So treating depression uh, improves MS. This is still, I can't prove that to you, but there is this data that when you look at the immune system, it quiets down that suggests that's the case. And treating the MS treats, uh, improves the depression. There's data for that. Now, I'll tell you, this is the canary in the coal mine. It was the depression. It was that Doug listened to the suffering of patients with transverse myelitis. And then I went with him and we started studying it. That, that, that told us what the problem was, one of the central problems in transverse myelitis. So it was the canary in the coal mine. And the most important thing is that depression is common, important, caused by the immune system auto, uh, activation, not by weakness. It's not that you're weak. It's not that you just can't cope with it. It's that there's this thing, unfortunately, messing with the part of your brain that controls mood, just like it messed with the part of your brain that controls you know, your bowel, bladder, sensory, like any other part of, of the illness. And it's treatable. That's the critical thing, that it's treatable. So the one law that does not change is that everything changes, and the hardship I was bearing today was only a breath away from the pleasures I would have tomorrow. And those pleasures would all be the richer because of the memories of this I was enduring. Suicide is always the wrong treatment for depression. Suicide is like luggage and herpes. It's forever, OK? Depression, depression is a temporary thing. And with treatment, it will get better. And so the depression is not, the, the suicide is not the treatment for this. The deeper sorrow carves into you, the more you, uh, the more you can hold. It's a little jabron, and I think that that is, you know, that's why I've sort of stayed and devoted my career here, is to be able to work with people like you who can hold a tremendous amount more than I think many uh, of the other people I meet. This is Jim Lubin. Paula knows this is my hero. Jim Lubin, if you don't know it, is the reason we had the Transverse Myelitis Conference, uh, the board meeting in uh, Seattle. Uh, was it last year, Sandy? Last year, because that's where Jim lives. Jim, at the age of 19, he's now 45. Am I getting that right? No. Thirteen years ago, Jim Lubin developed transverse myelitis, and he had a very bad course. He can no move nothing. Uh, from the neck down. He's on a ventilator behind his uh, wheelchair here. And, um, and 
Jim Lubin sips and puffs on this straw. It controls his wheelchair. He sips and puffs Morse code. And uh, he does 30 words a minute, which is faster than I can type. Uh, he runs the website. He's the webmaster for the Transverse Myelitis Association. And lots of people, when I tell them, look, Christopher Reeves, he's not, he didn't want to kill himself. He's directing movies. And they say, oh, sure, well, he's rich. Let me tell you, Jim is not rich. Jim has very little money. And when you talk to Jim, he says, look, you know, before I got this Transverse Myelitis, I was a computer geek who liked to hang out and listen to music. Now I get to do that full time. I mean, that's Jim Lubin, and um, he was depressed initially. He had pain initially. Twelve years later, he's not on anything, and he has no depression. Jim is an inspiring person to anybody who's ever met him. So these are the people I want to thank, obviously, Doug, uh, who has been sort of by my side in all of the thought processes that have been, been involved here, as, as Chitra has, Sandy and the rest of the posse from the TMA, and for all of the patients who have taught me a tremendous amount. And, and again, the, not only taught me, but it's because this patient population uh, people like yourselves who are affected by these things come and allow us to study these things that we make these uh, discoveries. And people sign up to do this more with transverse myelitis than I've ever seen any other patient population sign up. This is my daughter and Doug's daughter. And this is one of the best things that's come from the collaboration. Not that we had anything to do with each other's, uh, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but just that uh, our daughters are best friends. So that's everything I wanted to talk about today. Thanks very much for your time.